In the village of Changshan, you don't have to go very far to find the place where the ghosts live. At the monastery, the monks can show you the hillside where some of the bodies are buried, and the door to the room where Japanese soldiers took some of the people to dissect them. Wang Ji Shu was only a little boy when the Japanese came in 1942. Everyone knew it was a war, but there was something else going on that was different. People in Changshan were starting to get sick from diseases they'd never seen before. At first, a few people died every day, then whole households, fevers, and strange swellings in the armpits. When Wang's grandmother got sick, they brought her to the monastery because the Japanese said they would treat her there. But when they returned next, she had died and been dissected. Like the monk's world of the unseen, a lot of what happened in Changshan lives only in memories now. But in some parts of central China today, the pain from the Japanese attacks lives on in the limbs of the victims. You can find them scattered throughout the rural villages of central China. The few who are still alive were small children when the Japanese came in the 1940s. They say they were exposed to something that was sprayed in the fields. The infections left wounds that never healed. 
What they didn't know at the time was that they were more than just collateral damage in war, but guinea pigs in the most sophisticated biological weapons experiment the world has ever seen. The ruins of a place built for an evil purpose. We know a lot about other facilities in different countries, but most people outside of China have never heard of Ping Fan. Unit 731 was not uh, well known. Officially, Unit 731 was a Japanese military group organized to sanitize water during Tokyo's occupation of northern China in the 1930s. Unit 731's true purpose, though, was actually the opposite of disease prevention. Um, Unit 731 was the Japanese style uh, Auschwitz. To run it, they needed a man capable of a certain level of cruelty. And Japan had the right man, an ambitious young military doctor from a good family named Shiro Ishii. He thought Japan had to find a new weapon a new weapon of new type, a secret weapon, to win the war. They had the perfect leader, and they soon found the perfect location in the northeastern city of Harbin. Firmly under control of Japan's occupying army, and far enough away from the home islands to escape scrutiny, Ishii and his unit used forced labor to build the Auschwitz-sized complex at Ping Fan. Ishii Shiro was majored, was a medical doctor, you know. He was majored in medicine, so he said biological weapon was the best because it's, it's cheap. It's easy, easy to produce, and it, yeah, it's cheap, and it's killed automatically. Ishii and his men were interested in a long list of deadly diseases. They wanted to know which ones were most effective, how they could be controlled, and how they could be delivered. With free reign to experiment on the civilian population of Northeast China, Unit 731 was a paradise for Ishii's team of so-called doctors. The total number of people murdered just at Ping Fan may never be known. The records that exist show at least 10,000 were killed subjected to some of the cruelest experiments ever known. Infected with deadly diseases and then dissected, sometimes while they were still alive. They were given no more dignity than lab rats. Okawa Fukumatsu is one of the last living soldiers from Unit 731. Living out his days in his simple home in central Japan, he's open about the things he did as a young man stationed at Ping Fan. Uh, <laughs> 
内臓を取ってな予報に入れて、うん、でペストとかこれら赤血液流長期分かな Fukumatsu remembers testing five different diseases on people, injecting them with the pathogen, and then removing their organs later for study, often while they were still alive. でお母さんも殺してなそれが一番なあの鳴き声がこっからまだ取れへんよ、うん、しょっ Though Fukumatsu is haunted by what he did at Ping Fan decades ago there is still some honor in the sense that he served his country in wartime His ceremonial sword from those days is still with him and still part of his identity. Japan's bombardment of Shanghai and central China during the Second World War. As horrifying as the attacks were, what they didn't know was that a new weapon was being used against them. The best techniques perfected by Unit 731 at Ping Fan were now being deployed against civilians on a region wide basis. Wang Xuan's ancestral village is Changshan. She spent decades researching Unit 731 and the plague epidemic that happened in Changshan during the war. So one third of the people died of the plague in the village. The local people didn't know anything about plague. There's no plague in written history for over a thousand years there has been no plague wang's research turned up records that the japanese military dropped eight kilos of plague infected fleas it was one of the most effective weapons developed by unit 731 and the Japanese were eager to know about the results. The, the army sent a special mission unit to investigate the plague in my village. So these were biological warfare specialists. They cut people open and they published scientific papers on the experiments. while the dissection rooms at the Changshan Monastery serve as a reminder of the plague attacks. Much less is known about the hideous disfigurements that still afflict people in the area, what's come to be known in China simply as rotten leg syndrome. While it's thought to be connected to Unit 731's anthrax and glanders weapons, there's been little consensus among doctors on what the lifelong open-sore infections are caused by. Those sufferers 
all seem to have one thing in common, being present in rural fields during the time of the 731 attacks. Battleship Missouri, 53,000 ton flagship of Admiral Halsey's third fleet, becomes the scene of an unforgettable ceremony, marking the complete and formal surrender of Japan. We are gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The end of the war and the American occupation brought the hope that those responsible for Japan's atrocities would be brought to justice, and that the force of America's great global power would ensure that kind of evil was gone for good. While the Allied powers pursued that course in post-war Europe, soon became clear that things were going to be different in Asia. Well, obviously, uh, the Pacific War was the uh, was the lead up to uh, what happened uh, during the U.S. occupation of Japan. Michael Penn is an American journalist who's been based in Tokyo for years. The American public uh, and the American military and the American government, they had a very clear priority when they began the occupation of Japan, and that is they want to make sure that what just happened in the Pacific War would never and could never happen again. As Japanese people rebuilt their cities from the ground up, the American occupation set out to rebuild Japanese society as a pacifist democracy. Suspected war criminals were brought to justice at the Asian counterpart to Europe's Nuremberg, the Tokyo War Crimes Trial. The objective was to make sure that those who had done terrible things during the war, uh, both in China and in the Pacific, uh, were held accountable for it and that those bad people, the war criminals, uh, pay the price for what they had done. But strangely absent from the dock in the Tokyo war crimes trial were some of the worst offenders, like Unit 731 mastermind Shiro Ishii. And the incentive to go after those men would change even further when the Americans made a radical change in policy, something that came to be known as reverse course there began to be critics of the early occupation policy. They said, whoa, 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 wait a second, what are we doing here? These young New Dealers who are uh, writing uh, pacifism into the Japanese constitution and who are uh, you know, starting to uh, try to revitalize the Japanese economy through measures that look a lot like socialism, uh, they began to get alarmed that uh, Japan would be moving in a direction which was closer to the Soviet Union than it would be to the United States. While at the time, reverse course appeared as a predictable response to the rising tensions of the Cold War, one consequence 
was that the masterminds of Unit 731 were allowed to quietly return to their homes and not face prosecution, but with one important catch. If America had put uh, the man who was responsible, General Ishii, uh, in front of the Tokyo uh, court, then it would have been clear that th such things are not overlooked and such things we may you to pay for this. But they didn't do it because they needed him for their own research and he agreed to do it. Uwe Richter is a German who has spent his career living and working in Japan as a university professor. He says the differences between Germany's post-war story and Japan's are striking. German students, high school students, read uh, this book of this uh, uh, American historian, uh, Hitler's uh, willing helpers or something like that. And there is no such book being read, as far as I know, in Japanese high schools. Uh, the uh, Japanese young people uh, do not hear, do not understand why uh, the mass of the Japanese people and young people were willing uh, to go to war. While Germany's atrocities in World War II ended with the prosecution of the worst of the worst and the repudiation of Nazism by much of German society, the world seems to have demanded less from Japan. Richter thinks some of that was cultural, but it was also convenient for Tokyo's new rulers. It happened a little bit more in Germany and not so much in Japan. And why? Because the Americans didn't want to let it happen. The Americans wanted cooperation against the new enemy, the Soviet Union. So they stopped looking for bad persons if these persons were willing to cooperate with us, the Americans. As the Cold War became a race to build the world's worst weapons of mass destruction, the American occupiers of Japan soon discovered the remnants of Unit 731 had something to offer them. Shouso Izami is a Japanese doctor who studied the weapons Unit 731 developed. Dr. Azami says of the many terrible bioweapons that Unit 731 developed, they came to focus on anthrax, plague, and glanders. By weaponizing plague, he says, they created a modern version of the Black Death from the Middle Ages, making bombs loaded with plague-infected fleas, where the disease would follow the usual route, from fleas and rats to people. Having created the world's most sophisticated bioweapons program and then testing it on those like the people in Changsha, Unit 731's atrocities amounted to rare scientific data that was too tantalizing 
for Washington to ignore. And so after coming back to Japan, she uh, uh, pretended to dissolve the army, Unit 731, but actually uh, the members uh, lived at least until uh, the outbreak of the Korean War. And they uh, were uh, communi communicating each other. And Ishii uh, had been giving his orders to the ex-members. Researchers like Takeo Matsumara found that not only were Unit 731's leaders protected, but a steady stream of documents and data from human experimentation started to flow to the U.S. Ishii and other uh, Japanese politicians tried to negotiate with the American command and, uh, and the Pentagon. And uh, eventually, uh, that negotiation was successful, which means that the, uh, all the documents, including the human experimentation, uh, about the uh, jam affairs were given to the United States. Instead, all the members, including Ishii of the unit, were immune. So in Tokyo tri Tribunal, there was no uh, uh, discussion about the Unit 731 and jam affairs. Ishii had been able to do what the Nazis who committed similar war crimes couldn't, negotiate immunity for himself and his deputies in exchange for sharing with Washington the techniques they developed from human experimentation and mass murder of Chinese civilians. Ishii was left to live out his years at home in this quiet Tokyo neighborhood. After his death from cancer, he was given a dignified memorial at the family plot nearby. The United States Army presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. No thinking person looks on this development with any sense of pride, but rather one of reality. Because today the threat of large scale chemical, biological, and radiological warfare cannot be ignored. Working up defenses against chemical, biological, and radiological warfare is the responsibility of the Army Chemical Corps. Frederick, Maryland is a medium-sized city a short distance from Washington, D.C. It would be an unremarkable place if it wasn't for the presence of Fort Detrick here, headquarters for the U.S. military's biological weapons work, and the place where Ishii's Unit 731 techniques were brought. After the war, there were four uh, United States investigations about the Unit 71 and JAM affairs. Most important report was FELL report. In that report, the human experimentation was very clearly uh, described. And all the germs uh, 
uh, one by one were described uh, very in detail, surprisingly in detail, because the United States tries to use that information uh, in future. The information the U.S. got was the product of some of the cruelest atrocities committed in the 20th century. Among the hideous experiments done by Unit 731, researchers have found evidence that Chinese prisoners were tied to stakes while bombs laced with plague and anthrax were exploded near them. Other prisoners were forced to drink milk infected with cholera and typhus. While some victims simply had deadly diseases injected directly into their bodies. One account from central China in the early 1940s had Unit 731 giving chocolates filled with anthrax to Chinese children. Nothing was too depraved for the scientists of Unit 731, whose code name for their victims was Maruta, or Logs. Not only had the U.S. obtained the details of Unit 731's human experiments, they also knew full well the extent of the biological attacks in central China. As Fort Detrick was ramping up its Cold War bioweapons production, Japan's atrocities proved to be Washington's gain. That fact was confirmed in 1947, when Fort Detrick's science chief wrote about the Unit 731 data. Evidence gathered in this investigation has greatly supplemented and amplified previous aspects of this field, he wrote. Such information could not be obtained in our own laboratories because of scruples attached to human experimentation. And as some researchers have charged, the unassuming Maryland facility was about to become the center of one of the Cold War's most mysterious and controversial episodes. The best defense against biological warfare is the defense that takes place before the germs reach your ship and contaminate everything they touch. A gas mask protects you because it filters the BW agents out of the air you breathe. It covers your nose, mouth, and eyes, three of the four main portals through which germs can get inside your body. As the Cold War intensified in the early 1950s, the U.S. was preparing both defensive and offensive capabilities for biological weapons. While the stated policy was that America wouldn't engage in first use of the new weapons acquired with the help of Unit 731, a new conflict soon emerged that some say changed that thinking. By 28 November, the Chinese Communists have again entered the fighting in far greater force than they did a month previously. This halts the UN general assault and drives UN troops back, especially on the right flank of the Western Line, where South Korean resistance is crumbling. Korea was the first major conflict of the Cold War. At the outset, the Americans called it a police action but the entrance of a massive, well-trained Chinese force on the side of the North Korean communists turned it into a perilous, all-out war. The U.S.-led coalition forces faced a brutal fight, often in frigid winter conditions. 
it turned into a grinding stalemate. Then in early 1952, Chinese and North Korean forces started to report sightings of strange insects on the frozen landscape. Insects not known to the area and certainly not expected at that time of year. Some of the reports said they coincided with flyovers and bombing runs from American aircraft. Those strange events, the communists said, preceded outbreaks of diseases that were also not previously circulating in the area. Chinese newspapers at the time ran headlines of outbreaks of diseases like plague among communist forces. And evidence, they claimed, showed the Americans were using airplanes to drop disease-infected insects. The usage of the germ uh, of air weapons uh, was very much limited. That was only the trial. Declassified U.S. military documents from the war show that at its peak, U.S. generals recognized they were facing a numerically superior enemy that had the potential of forcing UN forces out of Korea. At one point, U.S. generals even requested the authority to use atomic weapons. While that request was denied, the paper trail shows a series of orders for U.S. commanders to engage in a program of covert operations, including psychological warfare and unconventional means. While official U.S. policy had forbidden the use of offensive biological weapons, could a small covert unit have carried out attacks anyway? Researchers like Matsumara think so. At the beginning, I couldn't believe that uh, during the Korean War, the germ affair was carried on, but uh, I have been researching this topic for the last uh, more than 15 years and found now 90% there was a possibility that the United States used the germ warfare weapons. This is a germ bomb. On exploding, it opens out on a hinge. The main portion has four separate compartments. In Korea and Northeast China, large quantities of insects were found around these bombs. North Korea and China have never officially backed away from their charges that the U.S. attacked them with biological weapons. China produced a series of documentaries allegedly showing the U.S. bombs and the insects they said were released to spread disease. China also publicized a series of alleged confessions from captured U.S. pilots who admitted to biological weapons attacks but recanted as soon as they got home. The most famous of those was the story of Marine Colonel Frank Schwabel. After his capture, he was quoted by the Chinese as saying his purpose was to test under field conditions various elements of bacteriological warfare. Washington's explanation at the time was that the Americans had been subjected to a new and chilling form of coercion, something they called brainwashing, which was the first time that word was used. <laughs> 
In Changshan and the surrounding villages that were targets of history's biggest biological weapons attacks, the challenge now is to keep the story from fading into the past and pointing out its terrible legacy. We don't know how much uh, we humans learn from history. We hope we learn, but after a few generations, uh, if you are a pessimist, you might say that uh, we do not learn. A war crime that not only went unpunished, but turned into a research and development opportunity inherited by America. Whether U.S. use of biological weapons in the Korean War is true or not, the suspicion that it happened and its consequences today are understandable given what happened in China. Japanese biological warfare is a remaining war issue. It's a remaining war issue because it's covered up. It has been covered up. How can you do not apologize for a serious crime? The imposing walls of Tokyo's Imperial Palace are a reminder of Japan's wartime past and the culture that created Unit 731. While officially, the militarism and emperor worship of that time is long past, there are troubling signs of a new refusal to acknowledge those atrocities, let alone apologize for them. Tokyo's Yasukuni Shrine is one of the most controversial places in all of Asia. It houses the remains of some of Japan's worst war criminals. And it's a rallying spot for right-wingers who fly the old rising sun flag and deny the country's wartime atrocities. After World War II, Japan was, uh, well, uh, what shall I say, brainwashed to uh, commit the war crime. Hiromichi Motegi is a founder of the Society for Dissemination of Historical Fact. He says it's the Japanese who are now the victims of what he calls war guilt propaganda. And he questions whether the commonly accepted facts about things like the Nanjing Massacre are even true. Nanjing uh, Massacre, uh, which uh, uh, killed more than uh, three, uh, three uh, hundred thousand uh, uh, Chinese citizens are uh, spread in the world as if it's true, but uh, we we know now uh, through careful research, it's uh, only a part of uh, wartime uh, propaganda. Not surprisingly, someone who rejects the accepted facts about the Nanjing massacre doesn't feel that Japan should acknowledge or apologize for the crimes of Unit 731. They were uh, not uh, accused by uh, other uh, uh, criminals. 
uh, in exchange for information uh, provided uh, to the US. It is very unfair, as if only Japanese, uh, well, military uh, explored such thing. No, America was far ahead. Soviet was notorious far ahead. It is true, Japan uh, and China uh, fought. But uh, usually held image that Japan or militaristic Japan invaded in a very peaceful uh, China. That image is completely wrong. War crimes, cover-up, and denial raise the question of consequences. But what might those be? History doesn't provide clear answers, though peaceful relations in this region have never been more important to the rest of the world. The East Asian world is going to play a much more important part in the world theater uh, than it used to play in the last uh, 60, 70 years. And one central part of this East Asian world is the relation between the two biggest uh, countries, China and Japan. There are new hopes for a path toward reconciliation in East Asia. Recent attempts by the Japanese government to change the constitution and allow for a more aggressive military were met with some of the biggest demonstrations in years at the Diet in Tokyo. Many average Japanese are aware of the lingering need to recognize and apologize for the war crimes, like those committed by Unit 731. And they have some powerful allies. Former Prime Minister Yukio Hatayama sees it simply. Japan should keep apologizing until there are no calls to do so anymore. Nanasa あ、Among those who carried out the atrocities of Unit 731, there is also a sense of the need to acknowledge and apologize. History shows us 
that evil struggles to survive in the light of openness and scrutiny. So when the U.S. chose not to punish the Unit 731 scientists in exchange for the data they got from human experiments, an opportunity was lost and a lingering schism was cast in a critical part of the world. And charges like U.S. use of bioweapons in Korea had more weight and plausibility. If the U.S. ever fully declassifies the files it got from Unit 731, it's unknown what new horrors might be revealed. And if the techniques developed by Ishii ever made their way to the CIA. In the years after Unit 731's crimes, scientists in the US and allies like Canada and the UK pushed ahead with work on anthrax weapons. Was this too the legacy of Ishii's work? While governments continue to conceal their connection, and hope the world will soon forget. In central China today, the story of Unit 731 lives on in the minds and bodies of its victims, and in their hopes that the world will not forget about them. <laughs>